Here, we see a measurement system that uses a multiple origin point method, a multi-centroid graph, or combined horizontal vertical slide rule, to measure the values, both absolute, denoted by bar, value bar, and relative, denoted by parenthesis, value, comma, value, parenthesis, of various variables. The values ascribed to the variables, such as plus or minus, and integer values, relate to the variable's distance from the primary vertical axis at a right angle to the horizontal midpoint. The structure is here applied to measuring the values of variables x and y, where the values given for one occur from the perspective, or from the POV, of the other. Thus, for example, the value on the middle left, y equals negative 3, denotes the value of y from the point of view of x is negative 3. In this arrangement, we see that x is the individual, and y the group or collective of any given society or culture of the same species as x. Thus, the middle vertical axis measures the minimum values of x to y and of y to x, and the further from this, the greater their perceived values become. The top arc above the middle axis line is symbolic of the free market of exchange between the individual and the society or group, and constitutes a graphic depiction of our elevated, though arbitrary, overinflated valuation of imaginary commodities in this realm, where the very currency of exchange itself is fake. Below the horizontal axis line are the mind states of those individuals more prone toward an individual mindset, perspective or POV on the left, and those more prone to a collectivist mindset, perspective or POV on the right. The measure at the lower middle symbolizes the absolute value of reality as being comprised of twin halves, one the perspective of the individual, labeled X, the other that of the collective, society, or group, labeled Y. Moving toward the central most core of the model, we find the horizontal axis line symbolic of the perception between the individual, either of an independent or collectivist mindset, below, and the realm of social discourse, above. We see the motivation for the independent individual to initiate the process of interacting with the exterior realm of society is needs, and the comparable force motivating the collectivist individual is manufacture. What one person needs, another can make, and what one person makes, another may need, such as society to the individual. As we delve into the utmost central depths at the core of the model, we find the mechanism of exchange between the interior individual and the exterior society. It is comprised of subjective knowledge in the semicircle on the left, and, supposedly, objective good and evil in the square on the right. As knowledge originating from the future, labeled F for future, increases, following the path of logic, labeled PR for present, options decrease into memory, labeled PA for past. Such is considered the 
subjective aspect of the independent individual, labeled psi of y. The objective aspect of the collectivist individual, labeled psi of x, is comprised of morality leading one toward their destiny, labeled nam, while their independent individual will leads them away from this end. Now let us examine each quadrant in the same detail we have now covered for the core of the model. As we move toward the lower right corner, we see more of the objective nature of good and evil expressed as the opposition of morality and will. We see that karma motivates toward the will, while conflict motivates toward morality. From the point of view of X, or the independent individual, the objective aspect of the collectivist individual, Y, is evil, but can be overcome and be made good through such a person's actions relative to society. Hence, the lower right quadrant is defined by good over evil, or relative good over all. If the absolute value of Y, a collectivist individual driven toward morality by conflict, embraces the idealism of martyrdom, then their values from the perspective of an independent individual will begin to approach those of the independent individual themselves, expressed as the absolute value of X. Here we see the relative value of X from the POV of Y and the relative value of Y from the POV of X, combined to measure the absolute value of reality but that the absolute value of reality as a whole supersedes the combinations of X and Y as a total of an individual's perceptions by the amount of their imbalance one to the other, determined by the ratio between their relative value to one another and their absolute value to themselves. The inner values of the independent individual, or the absolute value of X on the diagram, tend toward altruism over materialism. But because materialism is seen by the independent individual as evil, and altruism is seen by the materialistic collectivist as evil, then the lower left quadrant, describing the philosophy of the independent individual X, is labeled as evil over evil. Thus, we find the independent individual X becomes closer to the collectivist's individual values Y in a counterclockwise revolution around this model. While opposite this, the values of the collectivist individual Y become closer to those of the independent individual X in a clockwise revolutionary pattern around the model Thus, if an independent individual begins from solipsism to embrace materialism, they will be approaching the values of a collectivist individual. Likewise, if a more collectivist individual embraces meaninglessness following altruism, they will have acquired the most independent-minded philosophical viewpoint, that of transcendentalism, which combines naturalist pastoral agrarianism simple self-sustaining homesteading, and trance-meditation. Transcendentalism is founded on belief in and study of the existence of natural laws greater than the individual's mental abilities to control. Where transcendentalism differs from solipsism is in the valuation of these natural laws. Transcendentalism values a harmonious ratio between natural laws and the interior realms of the individual's own mind, labeled psi, while solipsism, pursuing the concourse of meaninglessness, extends beyond natural laws to a point wherein the value of the collective from the point of view of the individual 
is negative 3, an expression implying 3 degrees of uselessness and dystrophy. From this maximal distance away from the values of the collective, the independent individual X will only begin to approach the collective and share its values if motivated to do so by the needs of their survival. As needs tend toward becoming merely wants, as the independent individual begins to approach the values of the collective, survival tends more toward evolution. The angle at which the transition from needs for survival to wants for evolution occurs is determined by adaptation expressed as a diagonal from the intersection of survival and evolution, labeled y equals positive 3, tending toward the intersection of natural law's existence with the interior subjective aspect of the independent individual, labeled x equals positive 2. Needs stray from a path determined naturally by adaptation from survival toward evolution due to belief, causing needs to lead instead toward the individual becoming a producer of a good or service to offer as a benefit to society. According to modern economic theories, if one does not produce a good or service to offer for the benefit of society, one cannot attain the transition between survival's needs and evolution's wants. Thus, based on this belief, the individual next applies knowledge to the formation of their own craft to offer in the social market. Because the knowledge of society's requisite crafts and marketplace finds them to be evil relative to the good of the independent individual from their own perspective, the entry of the individual into the social market is considered the quadrant of evil over good. Motivated by a desire for minimum loss and potential future profits, the individual invests in their craft and enters the market. As the individual enters the market, they are guided first by knowledge in constructing their craft, but then by belief in the market itself. At the peak of market demand, we find the absolute values of X and Y are exactly equal to one another. Thus, at the pinnacle centroid point on the diagram, the values of x and y cease being relative to one another, but that below this point, or to either side, they become relative to one another. As the minimum gains invested into the individual's craft, due to their belief in the market, approach the maximum profits level. The difference between demand, governed by shortage, and supply, governed by surplus, is measured as a diagonal from the core of the economic portion of the diagram, labeled x equals 0, y equals 1, tending toward the value, labeled x equals negative 2 of the independent individual from the perspective of society that is most aligned with the good of both parties involved, the good over good, wherein the good of the many and the good of the one are exactly equal. The role of the individual producer ceases here and is replaced by that of a group of consumers as supply approaches shortage due to influences on distribution and manufacturing in the industry of mass producing the goods and services designed by the individual producer as their craft. As maximum profits dwindles towards maximum costs, the ratio of surplus to shortage governing this trend is itself determined by the rate at which industry can manufacture a product 
and distributed, packaged, to meet demand in the market. The ratio of supply to demand is the key factor in modern thinking on economic law. Economic law, unlike standard nutrition, the concept of unenforced law, or the deification of theism, are all constructs by the mind of the collectivist individual, who values society most to conceptualize the nature of society's artificial laws. To the mind of the collectivist individual, the only thing separating an individual's craft that becomes an industry's product, labeled X equals positive 3, from the surplus group of consumers, labeled Y equals negative 2, is ability. Thus, the lure of advocating artificial laws less than the mind because they are products solely of human imagination is that by an individual's ability to conform and to influence a system from within, obeying artificial laws is justified by its rewards. As we descend into the mindset of a collectivist individual, we see that totalitarianism, a political dictatorship, is below artificial laws, less than the mind, parallel to transcendentalism, a naturalist philosophy, below the natural laws greater than the mind, in the mindset of a more individualistic individual. Seeking meaningfulness and inspired by social heroism, idolizing public figures, the collectivist individual embraces the moral relativism of good over evil, or more exactly, the good of the many over the good of the few or the one. A collectivist individual who embraces moral relativism may yet attain idealism by the self-sacrificial act of martyrdom, the placing of the good of a goal, cause, or movement above the good of oneself. Now that we have looked at each of the four quadrants of this diagram and examined the complexity of its labeling within the intricacies of its skeletal framework, we may begin to have some understanding of how the individual, divided within themselves between the individualistic self-serving survivalist realism and collectivist altruistic utopian idealism, schools of thought that pre-exist the individual born into human society, functions relative to and interacts with their social surroundings. Within the mind of the individual that is equally influenced by individualism and collectivism is the perception of the absolute value of reality as a combination of both these values, expressed as X and Y. Looking back over the entirety of this diagram, we may also examine it as a method for measuring motion on a torus, or hypersphere. If the quadrants are taken as fixed location measurements of the values of the exterior over the interior circles, such that the interior circle rotates in the opposite direction as the outer circle, then from relative good over evil would follow relative evil over good, and vice versa, due to the dipolar magnetic repulsive effect of the opposed doubled values, good over good and evil over evil. Thus, the directions of motion indicated by the arrows in this diagram are based on the nature of higher dimensional topographic geometries being applied as a skeletal construct upon which to place labels involving individual interaction with society to better understand how and why such effects may be considered a valid comparison. While we can see that the individual's interaction with their social surroundings is depicted by the inner circle, we can also define how this value is extracted from its relation to the individual and placed into material reality as an existent object, the individual's craft, via this process. 
and we can see this process depicted by the upper circle that has the same diameter and circumference as the inner circle, but which measures the radius of the entire toroid model. We may thus understand the difference between an individual and their creative offspring or intellectual contributions, etc., is the same as the difference between the interior and the radius of a torus or fourth spatial dimensional sphere. Because the geometry of this model is based on hyperdimensional shapes and fourth spatial dimensional forms, we should expect to find similarities between it and other graphs or diagrams that are based on the same models or that use the same hyperdimensional four spatial geometries. If we examine the horizontal axis of this diagram, dividing the individual and their interior values below from the social surroundings and their value as reality above, we can begin to see how the one influences the other and how one guides the other along according to the same rules of motion that would influence the measurement of a torus diameter in four space or rather in the additional direction of time measured as motion. In the next section of this lecture we will be considering how this arrow of time measuring across the horizontal axis of this diagram as the diameter of a torus changes rates at varying phases due to the consistency of the medium through which it passes. For example, we can see that the rate at which the diameter progresses from y equals negative 3 on the far left center toward x equals positive 2 along the arc radiant labeled needs takes the same amount of time for an individualistic individual to accomplish as the distance from y equals negative 3 on the far left center to x equals positive 3 on the far right center for a collectivist individual to achieve by their ability to bridge the gap between y equals negative 2 and the intersection of manufacture with artificial laws. So, in this diagram, we will be examining only the horizontal axis, measuring the arrow of time as the diameter of a torus. Here we see that, where space is measured as a horizontal axis at a right angle to positive above and negative below entropy, the density of space is determined according to a lag in the distance traveled by various quanta given an equal duration of time. This pattern, reflected also in the solar plasma sheaths extension of penumbral EM coiling, reflects a lag or discrepancy in pacing of purely solid matter versus purely plasma energy, and results in the accumulation of additional mass over density equals matter, such that the otherwise more sinusoidal wavelength pattern here assumes a more covalent wave front, akin to a phi spiral pattern. We see in this diagram as matter, black arc, left side of chart, accumulates positive entropy, eventually it generates life, blue arc, which curbs the rate of entropy, followed by psi, symbolic of sentience, green arc, a very brief hyperacceleration of entropy, followed by the EM spectrum's purple arc center decline toward negative entropic zero point of C, the speed of photons in a void, followed by an increase through tachyons, C squared, the red arc, into ZPE, black arc on the right side. The points A through G should constitute a seven note chromatic spectral scale. The points Roman numerals one through six 
are considered levels of clearance in the T4 program. As we consider this process more closely, let us look first at the left half of the diagram, below the label of light speed, along the lower marked bar as zero. We see that the first stage of entropic decay to follow the division of the four elemental forces, one plankton following the Big Bang, the stage of fusion equals Earth, labeled in black on the far left, extends from negative nine units away from the speed of light at zero to negative six units away from light speed at zero. And this consists of an arc length of three units, while the arc length on the next stage, that of fission equals fire, in blue to the right, is only two units, and that of mind equals psi is only one unit. Now let us consider each of these varying elemental stages one phase at a time. We begin in the era governed predominantly by fusion and the coming together of matter to form stable atomic nuclei, attract electrons, form covalent bonds to create chemical molecules, etc. This stage of post-Big Bang era entropic decay, defined by predominantly the force of fusion, is associated with the terrestrial element of Earth because it was during this universal phase of elemental development that our own planet formed. Without fusion there could have been no solid matter and thus no Earth. The next stage of decay rates is fission associated with terrestrial fire. As we will examine at the end of this lecture this entire graph depicts forces as they are governed by entropic decay, but this graph is only one half of the total picture. In the era of fission, rising prior to that of fusion, beginning to wane, the sun, our star, was formed. In the era of fission's decline and decay, the sun, our star, will begin to die. And this is where we find ourselves in historical times today. So we arrive at the location on this diagram, depicting our own present position as an evolutionary development towards sentience, constituted by mind and labeled by the Greek letter psi. However, how do we know that mind, or our own concept of self-awareness and sentience, truly exists. Its existence may be measured by how it impacts upon and influences the context it is placed into. For example, we might predict that due to the influence of the existence of mind equals psi on the series of elemental forces decay rates, the electromagnetic forces correspondent trajectory in this diagram's context would reach a maximum peak of positive entropy almost immediately following mind equals psi, but would then be caused by this peak to decay at an increasing rate as well, and we would not find the elemental force of gravity equals water occurring at all. Because the elemental force of electromagnetism equals air would be consumed into a vortex of dipolar, positive and negative entropy, oriented perpendicularly, at a right angle, to the surface of this chart. Due to the influence of mind equals psi on the elemental force of electromagnetism equals air, we might expect to see the electromagnetic force, as it approaches light speed velocities, the speed of unimpeded photons spiraling around a zero point at C itself and approaching which by entropic decay into antimatter collisions and exotic particle cascades, the elements would decay at a much more rapid rate. In effect, the mind could cause 
the cosmic compositional elemental forces themselves to be flushed down the drain of time much faster. But we do not see this necessarily being the case in observations made of material reality. Instead, beyond the limits of even the force of electromagnetism faster than C, the energy of the electromagnetic equals air elemental force finally breaks form to cause the effect we call the elemental force of gravity equals water. But, as I said, the proof for the existence and the inner nature of the mind equals psi phase lies in the effect it has on its surrounding area, and we do not see the effect of mind equals psi warping the curvature of entropy plotted here so much that, at light speed, it would completely collapse. We begin again from fusion equals earth to proceed next into fission equals fire, and following from this we will next observe the peak point on the waveform curve occupied by mind equals psi. When we observe the indicated location on the diagram for mind equals psi as an elemental force of the cosmos itself, we can see it measures the same arc radian length as the second half of the force of fission equals fire would were it to continue down to connect with electromagnetism equals air in its negentropic arc. However, the elemental force of mind equals psi is, somehow, elevated positive entropically, such that it crests at the peak of the wave of forces between fission equals fire and the electromagnetic spectrum of background radiations. In doing so, it connects with electromagnetism equals air, at a point of greater positive entropy than if mind equals psi were excluded and the force of fission equals fire led directly into that of electromagnetism equals air. All of these aspects would seem to combine to indicate the influence on this model of some external additional factor omitted from depiction causing the depiction to become warped or distorted from what we would expect it to be, an average sinusoidal wavelength over time. Therefore, for the elements of space-time measured on this chart, those about which the least is now known, gravity and ZPE, are projected with the least degree of accuracy as being such an average sinusoidal wavelength over time. Recall while examining this model that a standard sinusoidal wavelength is also a depiction of a sphere's equator between twin poles, such as those depicted in this chart as the points of positive or negative entropy. Because this chart is only measuring entropy, as the decay rates of various quanta of the four elemental forces, it is only a depiction of the Big Crunch era that follows the cosmos reaching a certain moment of critical mass, and thus this diagram is only showing us exactly one half of the entire picture we should be considering. In order to depict the first one half of cosmic development following the Big Bang until critical mass was reached and entropy or time began, we may project this same model upside down and backwards to the model we have thus far considered in detail, and then consider, compare, and contrast how these models are similar or differ. To close the segment of this lecture discussing this model, I will offer the following diagram as Diagram 1, which will be a depiction of both the model we have thus considered and its inverse opposite prior to critical mass. Before the Big Bang, zero-point energy, the fifth element, was all that existed. When time began, 
the first force to form from ZPE was water equals gravity, followed by air equals electromagnetism, then by fire equals fission, and finally earth equals fusion, divided from ZPE, and space began, one Planck time following the Big Bang. This process is depicted along the upper half of Diagram 1 and reads from right to left. Along the lower half of Diagram 1 and reading from left to right is depicted the decay of matter into energy due to entropy over time. The four elemental forces are shown as arc radians of increasing or decreasing amounts of entropy, such that in the same amount of time, each element will propagate only a certain distance relative to every other. In the given time, one Planck time, a quantum of the force of Earth equals fusion can travel three basic units, while in the same amount of time, a quantum of the force of fire equals fission can travel three plus two basic units, at least. In diagram one, the force of psi equals mind is predicted. In model A of diagram 1, the predicted elemental force of psi equals mind occurs both on the lower, later scale and on the upper, earlier scale of elemental forces. Model A uses mirror symmetry along the lateral positive entropy axis to predict that psi equals mind occurs in the manner it does on the lower later scale because it is reflecting an earlier precursor appearance of a similar force to psi equals mind depicted on the scale reading right to left above. Model B depicts this concourse of the forces one Planck time following the Big Bang without the elemental force of psi equals mind being present during the period of original division of the four elemental forces from ZPE. Because there is no way to collect data from the period of time one Planck time following the Big Bang when critical mass was reached and entropy or time began, Almost the entirety of this diagram remains purely speculative and theoretical, a model meant to represent symbolically averaged rates of quantum decay given zero resistance. When we consider that this averaged sinusoidal wavelength, measuring the rates of quantum decay against zero resistance, can also be derived or decomposed from the chart depicting the individual of our species within our modern format of society. The question quickly becomes, what are quantum decay rates doing appearing in the middle of the diagram depicting human society? The answer remains simple, though elusive, like the breeze whispering through the leaves of the trees. It is merely a measurement of entropy or decay over time and it is only altered as it passes through the phases described earlier in the first half of this lecture. The diagram of the four elemental forces is only a river, adapting to the terrain defined for it as the path of least resistance across the topology of the diagram of human society. The sinusoidal wavelength passes through the social model like the sounds of a song, in one ear and out the other, some being retained more, some being forgotten faster.